Okay, thank you. You may have a seat. That wasn't too bad. Vicki, would you please stand up? Where are you? Did you just appear? This is the lady right there who wrote the words to this song. For some of you, if you don't know who did it, um, Vicki wrote these words to this music, and I think she did a wonderful job. I would like to turn now to 97. 97. Some of you that have been in hymn sings with me before might remember how I like to do this song. I just love to do it this way, and we're going to do it again. If you read the words and look at the music, you will see the phrases repeat each other. It's kind of like talking back and forth to each other. So we're going to split right down the center aisle. You guys are ones, you guys are twos. Ones and twos. The ones are going to sing the first phrase, and I'll speak it to you. The Lord Jehovah reigns, his throne is built on high. Okay, the second group's going to come in, same melody. The garments he assumes are light and majesty. And then one comes in, different melody, and it's shorter now. His glory shine with beam, oh, his glory shine with beams so bright. And then everyone, the last phrase, no mortal eye can bear the sight. Got it? Those of you that remember, sing right out. You'll catch on to it real quick. It just speaks back and forth so neat that we need to do these kind of things in our services, in our song services once in a while, to give them a little pizzazz, to, to lighten it up a little bit, and let us really enjoy the Lord Jehovah reigns. His throne is built on high. Don't sing it like you're tired. Okay, so stand up again, please. Give us the entire piece. Here's what the ones will sing, and then the twos. Okay, we're going to start one more time. Everybody's got it now. Sing it, get your books up, and let me hear you. Okay? One, two, sing. The Lord Jehovah, his throne is built high. The garment. Good. Short ones. His glory with being so Everybody, no more can bear the sight. The thunder keep the wide world. Good job. His Oh God. And 
to welcome everyone here in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a day. <laughs> Indeed. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Today, has been mentioned, has been a historical day in the Remnant Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We definitely witnessed a empowering of the Holy Spirit today and felt the impresses of that spirit as well. I would like to welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ tonight. Behind me, <clears throat> Priest Keith Kirkshank, President Carrie Patience, Teacher Alex Van Cannon, Alex Tibbetts, <laughs> and Elder <clears throat> Eric Collins. I apologize. I'm a little choked up because it's been a very emotional day for me. I, I thought about this day long and for a long time, but uh, as I've witnessed to my brothers at the Oklahoma reunion, I did have inspiration and guidance in the calling of President Patience. I had the opportunity of sitting under the mantle of the spoken word from Brother Patience a couple years ago, as did some of you. And in that message, President Patience asked us, what is God? God is love. So I've chosen that as my opening scripture but before I share that scripture with you I think that each and every one of us here tonight has felt an outpouring of that God's love here in this holy sanctuary today we've not only felt it but we've seen it we've not only seen it but we've heard it through the voice of our sister Larson as she proclaimed Brother Fred's choice as his replacement and his successor, High Priest Terry Patience, who is now our President Terry Patience. So with that being said, I'll share the scripture with you. <clears throat> we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. At this time, we'll follow the order of service as is in your bulletin, and we'll continue this service under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Is my prayer tonight. So shall we turn our hymnals to number 336, and stand and sing and remain standing for the invocation by teacher Alex Tibbetts.
most kind and gracious, loving Heavenly Father. Father, we once again approach thy throne of grace this evening, thanking you for the blessings we have received thus far this day, and that we expect them to continue even now. Just be with our dear brother, present patience, and give him clarity of mind and thought to share those words you've laid upon his heart, and help us to heed those counsels, O Father. Be with us and help us to truly be one in Christ and to establish thy Zion upon this earth. Help us to seek your will and to do it. Is our prayer this evening in Jesus Christ's sacred holy name. Amen. time for our offering, time to return a little of what the Lord has blessed you with back to him. And as an example, I'll just mention Abram when he met with Melchizedek and paid him his tithes from all that he had and paid him his excess all the way back in Genesis as it should be if the gentleman would come forward about. Lord, we come to you now. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day, for your presence here, for all those that can make it. And Lord, we return part of your blessings at this time and this offering. And Lord, we ask that you would bless all those that gave and all those with the desire to. And Lord, let this be used to further your kingdom. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I would like to, this evening, let scriptures talk for me. I have several, so I beg your listening ear. The first one that I would like to share tonight is taken from the first epistle of John in the first chapter, and I'm going to read a few verses that are here. Brethren, this is the testimony which we give of that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father was manifest unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that also may have fellowship with us and truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, we walk in if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all. In chapter 2, also of the first epistle of John. We read verse 5. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. <clears throat> Chapter 3. And whosoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And thereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Chapter 4. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time except them who believe. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Whereby know that we will dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Turning to the book of Revelations, third chapter. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcome, and am set down with my Father in his throne. <clears throat> in Third Nephi. Chapter 12. 
and for this cause he fulfilleth the words which he hath given, and he lieth not, but fulfilleth all his words, and no unclean thing can enter into his kingdom. Therefore nothing entering into his rest, save it be those who have washed their garments in my blood, because of their faith and the repentance of all of their sins and their faithfulness unto the end. Now this is the commandment, Repent, all ye ends of the earth, and come unto me, and be baptized in my name, that ye may be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost, that ye may stand spotless before me in the last day. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is my gospel, and ye know the things that ye must do in my church, for the works which ye have seen me do, that shall ye do also. For that which ye have seen me do, even that shall ye do. Therefore, if ye desire to do these things, blessed are ye, for ye shall be lifted up in the last days. Fourth Nephi. <clears throat> and it came to pass that there was no contention in the land because of the love of God which did dwell in the hearts of the people. And there were no envyings, no strifes, nor tumults, nor whoredoms, nor lyings, nor murders, nor any manner of lasciviousness. And surely there could not be a happier people among all of the people who had been created by the hand of God. There were no robbers, no murderers, neither were there Lamanites or any manner of ites, but they are in, but they are one, the children of Christ, and heirs unto the kingdom of God. And lastly, in the 85th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, <clears throat> and also I give unto you a commandment that ye shall continue in prayer and fasting from this time forth. And I give unto you a commandment that ye shall teach one another the doctrine of the kingdom. Teach ye diligently, and my grace shall attend you, that ye may be instructed more perfectly in theory, in principle, in doctrine, and in the law of the gospel, in all things that pertain unto the kingdom of God that is expedient for you to understand of these things in heaven and in earth and under the earth, things which have been, things which are, things which must shortly come to pass, things which are at home, things which are abroad, the wars and the perplexities of the nations and the judgments which are upon the land, and a knowledge also of countries and of kingdoms that ye may be prepared in all things when I shall send you again to magnify the calling where whereunto I have called you, and the mission which I have commissioned you. Thus ends the reading of the word. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name, Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance 
after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Thank you, Cheryl. A fitting song for what I have chosen as tonight's theme. This is Christ's church. This gospel is his, not mine, not anyone else's, not ours, but his. There are two parts that I feel I would like to talk to you a little bit tonight. One would be that we are to become a sanctified people and go on to perfection. And two, the need and desire to share this gospel that others may come to the wedding feast with us. Maybe a little of that is still the apostle that's hanging around in me. This is, as I have stated, Christ's church. It always was and always shall be. It does not belong to any one of us, no one in the leadership of the church. We are all but workers and servants to the God above and his son, Jesus Christ. If I ask you a question right now in your minds, how would you answer? Have we succeeded in becoming all that God wants his church to be? If we had Zion would be here and we would be worshiping with the church of the firstborn tonight and there would be a place upon this earth in this center place where Christ could return to and the government of the world could be upon his shoulders as expressed in Isaiah 9 6 many times in our modern scriptures we have been told a few things that we need to heed. Most of these have been given to us by our beloved brother Larson. For example, section 147 says that we are to prepare for the night is coming. Sanctify yourselves. 150 says that we have not yet fully grasped the vision of building up of my kingdom. 151 says that the marriage supper is waiting. Harmony and charity must prevail. 153, that we must remain apart from Babylon. 57, that we have not yet learned to prefer our brothers and sisters uplifting one another. And 164, still have not yet fully understood the import of the spiritual and temporal aspects of my gospel. Prepare for that which is to come. Gather in fellowship, study, and worship, and in your unity you will find strength in all things. Have we accomplished those goals, or is there much yet that we need to accomplish? Prepare for the night is coming. I'm almost 70 years old. I guess for the last 50 years, 60 years, 
And I remember being a teenager back in the 60s. Boy, I thought we were at the end then for sure. Things just couldn't get any worse than they did in the 60s, right? Is the night coming? Yes, it is. And every second of that clock that ticks by, we are getting closer and closer to that end. How are we preparing ourselves for that end? How have I prepared myself for that end? Am I fully sanctified and ready to meet the Savior? I have to admit, and I've mentioned this to several people over the last few days, I was really hoping the Savior would come this morning. Really? In hopes that he would be able to stand here and say, this is what I want. This is what you need to be doing. And take some of the burden off of our shoulders. Am I fully sanctified? Are you fully sanctified? You can only answer that question. I'm not. But there are things that I think I can do, and there are things that you probably realize that you can do to become more sanctified. 150 again, that we have not yet fully grasped the vision of building up of my kingdom. Do we understand, do we see the benefits of God's kingdom. I really like what Albert said last night when he admonished us that the time is short and we needed to spend all of our resources towards building up that kingdom because there is a benefit to that kingdom. Our lives can be spiritually better and stronger. Our relationships with each other's with you and your spouse and your children and your grandchildren and so forth can be better in the kingdom. 151, I mentioned marriage mentions the marriage supper is waiting. Harmony and charity must prevail. I'm going to get back to that. 153 again, that we remain apart from Babylon. That's a tough one. Because we are mixed amongst Babylon, and yet we have to try to live in it and still maintain some kind of spiritual life that is a step above what those are around us are experiencing. We cannot fall into their philosophies, their desires, their options. How many of you watch television and realize what they're trying to tell you? That your life is only going to be better if. Or how many of you realize how our culture has been changed over the last 50 years because of the TV shows that have been going on for 50 years? They say TV reflects society. I say unto you that society takes on the characteristics of whatever some of those shows propose. Are we remaining apart from Babylon? I can do better. Have you, have you learned to prefer your brothers and sisters? Are they more important to you than you are to you? How much would you be willing to sacrifice or put up with in surplus in order for others to have a benefit of a better life or of a more spiritual life? we but shared our surplus. And it also asks us that we uplift one another. I think that means that we uphold one another, care for one another, share with one another, put their needs above my needs. I can do a better job of that. And then 164 mentions that we have not yet fully understood the importance of the spiritual and the temporal and I know that Kevin has spoken to the benefits of combining the spiritual and temporal aspects which create the celestial kingdom. One cannot be had without the other. 
prepare for that which is to come. Gather in fellowship, study, and worship. I fear that the time may be readily approaching, if not already here, in which gathering into small groups and small communities isn't upon us. How can you or I protect ourselves from Babylon when we're so mixed and dependent upon it and buying into the philosophies that are there? I know that that's not an easy thing to say, but it could be that we will need to gather together closer the scripture mentions in fellowship, spending more time together. I'm not sure Gary Argensinger is here right now. Gary, there you are in the blue shirt. Okay. Gary, I remember times back in Missouri Valley when Gary would dream of sitting on his front porch on his rocker, waiting for one of the other saints to walk by and be able to sit there and talk to those saints for who knows how long. Right, Gary? I'm sure we might grow tired of each other also if that was every hour of every day, but what a spiritual upliftment that would be to be able to spend that much time with one another, even if it was just during the evening hours. We have done a fairly good job of gathering together and studying and worshiping, although I do believe that with the advent of the temple, which we need to be working on, our level of worship may be uplifted beyond where it's at today. How many times do you come to a Sunday morning worship service unprepared and leave unfulfilled? How many times do you really worship God in awe and wonder when you go to church? Or do you come and go through the motions? We must uplift our worship somehow because as we do that we will grow stronger and I know that there will be people out there in the world will go there is something going on with those remnant saints what is it I want it I love the picture I think it's out here in the hallway of Zion and you see the column of light coming up from the kingdom from the community. How true that must be. That is that beacon. That is that light upon the hill that others need to see, to be enriched by, in order for them to look at us. Because right now, they may just see us as regular old Christians going to church on Sunday morning. The scriptures mentions many times that we are to prepare the bride for the wedding feast, especially in R151 4a. In this covenant, the groom is promising to support his bride and the bride covenants to come prepared for the betrothal. We might, I think, have a fairly good understanding of the Jewish custom. Perhaps it isn't practiced out as much today as it was in the days of Christ. But the story basically goes that somehow or another, two parents get together, decide their children are good for each other, and they betroth them together. And for one year, they are married without consummation of that marriage or living together in a marriage-type situation so that they might prepare themselves for the day when the full wedding is completed. That is the time when the groom has the opportunity to prepare whatever it is he is preparing. In this case, I think it's for us his kingdom. And we covenant to come together as the bride, ready to be everything the groom expects us to be. Are we there yet? Are you or I fully what the groom expects us to be? That is the period of time in which we are currently in. He is promising us, promising us that he will take care of us. He will support us 
if we come to the wedding feast totally prepared and ready to be his bride. Can you imagine that kind of kingdom? When we have come totally sanctified, totally in tune with what he wants, and he is then promising to support us and take care of us as we live in his kingdom. I truly believe we are upon that throne of when this day will come. Kevin and I were talking the other day and he mentions that he also feels that we are upon that threshold. He also mentions that there may be, if you remember the wedding feast story, many people who were rich and famous who decide not to come to the wedding. Oh, they're too busy. And so Christ calls out to fill the wedding feast to the brokenhearted upon the streets. It could be that we will start seeing more broken people coming to the wedding feast and we need to be ready to receive them. And in many ways, I consider myself to be a broken person. How about you? Do I need the Savior? Do I need his love? Do I need his grace, his forgiveness, that I might be ready for the wedding? Yeah. We all do. Part of that Hebrew custom that Jesus has referred to so many times, referred to what was called the ritual washing or immersion. I've heard those words someplace before. This is a spiritual cleansing that the bride and the groom both took part in. Research tells me that some of the time they would do it separately for preference. Other times they would do it together, symbolizing the union they were hoping to have. But in both cases, they were going to the rabbi and saying, wash me, cleanse me that I might be ready for the bride, ready to be the bride, and ready for the groom. Most of us in this room have done that. We have gone through that ritual washing and immersion. We call it baptism. And after that comes the betrothal period in which we are to become sanctified that we might be clean and prepared for the actual wedding itself. What if as I, my heart had desired, Christ had come this morning. How might that have changed this day for you? As we prepare for this wonderful event, the wedding feast, we are to keep ourselves and our garments pure and to be arrayed in our bridal attire, always, always, always ready. I've brought up sanctification, and I'd like to review that here just real briefly. I pulled these from a sermon that I gave a few months ago. First bullet, to set that thing of person apart for the use intended by its designer the full and proper way of functioning. Who's our designer? The guy upstairs is the one who's designed us. He has made us in his image, and we should be constantly trying to live up to that image. Yes, sometimes we falter and fail. But we are not fully sanctified. We are not fully ready to be with the Savior in the wedding feast till we are what the designer wants us to be, the full and proper way of functioning. Is the world functioning in God's way? Is that why I see so much chaos is because they're living the path of God? I think not. Sanctification also means that we are to become all that God has made us to be. I think that's been explained in the previous bullet. 
when all of our human aspects become godly, that our mind and our intellect is aligned with his. Are we thinking the way God wants us to think? Do we understand what God wants us to think? That our hearing and our spirit and our desires, our compassions, our understandings, our capacity to love, our brightness of hope, our unselfishness, our insecurities are totally vanquished because we are living in the groom ready to be his mate. Do we fully trust him? Am I willing to give up all that I think I must have and need in order to be able to reach that kind of perfection? And that perfection is a work that began in our regeneration that came about in our ritual washing and immersion. And because of the atonement of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He died on the cross that we might be able to have this opportunity to be totally sanctified, to be able to be the bride, that we might be able to accept this incredible, incredible gift that he is giving us. In Exodus 19, verses 3 through 6, we find an interesting story. At Mount Sinai, some big mountain someplace back east, God established a partnership with his people through humanity, through which humanity could be redeemed. That's what Israel was all about, to show the world what it was like to live with God. God was working with these people, just as he is with us, to become a people that worship God. And by that, I mean that we revere God more deeply than anything else. And that was to be in their daily, and in their daily lives, as well as in their corporate dealings with one another. They were a people that were to realize the importance of the atonement even though it was ahead of them in time. And where mankind would be without that sacrifice, without Christ dying upon the cross. They were a people who needed to realize that they were broken. I've mentioned that. And in some way, we are all broken and in need of restoration and repair and brought again into the fold of God. The Israelites were to be a people that because of that realization, they could become those people who could serve others, show charity, show grace, and not offended or take offense. And they have been mutilated down through time because they tried to live what they thought were the laws of God. Yes, maybe they didn't accept the Messiah, but how many of the Hebrew people have been killed over the years because they were misunderstood or not liked. They were to be a people that would freely share the church and the gospel principles of that church, Christ Church. A people that would stand firm in their beliefs and would not sway no matter what. And not be afraid to say, this is what God wants his people to do and to be. Oh, sure. Moses went up on the mountain. He came back down, found the Israelites dancing around an idol. So no, they didn't do their job very well sometimes. Neither do we. But usually when Moses would call them to attention, remind them of what they were supposed to be doing, they would return to those principles and say, we're sorry, God, forgive us. They were to be a people that worked on relationship with those in the church and those not yet in the church. They were to be a people that would cherish the ordinances 
keeping them holy and pure. Yes, their ordinances were different than ours in some ways, but they were teaching ordinances in their day. They taught them the different aspects of what God was like and what they needed to pay attention to. We are fortunate. We don't have to follow the tabernacle as much as we can follow today's ordinances and keep them holy and pure. This may mean that we will need to gather closer together, that we might be able to protect one another from the world and Babylon and the chaos that surrounds us. This may mean that we can gain strength from our worship and study and living out of the principles of God. This may mean that we help others to gather in, that they may also enjoy the blessings. It may mean that we will need to present a more attractive and active Aaronic priesthood. This may mean that we will have to increase all of our abilities as ministers, friends, members, family members, and to magnify those callings. There are a lot of young people out there who are watching and waiting to see what we do. And today's millennial people are not so much asking, oh, what are they doing over there? I'd sure like to know what they're doing over there. They're more or less asking the question, who are they? Yeah, they believe in this and that, but has it changed their life? And through the magnification of their callings, have they become something special that they would like to take a look at? They're asking us the same question. Who are we becoming? And are we exemplifying to them who we say we are? D&C 158 reads, I wait to endow you with greater understanding and power, my remnant flock, but too many of you are enmeshed in the things of this world. You must find your way out of Babylon. Greater sacrifice and discipline than you have known before will be required for the work that truly lies ahead. Arm yourselves with great faith, knowledge, humility, and love, and all will be well. How much time do you spend near your altar? How much time do you spend in your scriptures? I could do better. Can you? This particular scripture I just read mentions faith. Believe that God and Jesus are. Are you convinced that God and Jesus exist and are? and that they will assist us as we strive to do better in our lives? The scripture says that we need to believe that there will be a kingdom. If we really believe there will be a kingdom, what are we doing about that belief? If I believe it's going to rain this afternoon, I pick up an umbrella. If I believe the kingdom is coming, what do I do? Do I react to that? Do I share that? Do I want it for others? Do I live a life accordingly? And by so believing that there will be a kingdom, you will have the strength to endure the darts and the arrows that the adversary has been throwing at us and just about every other Christian believer in the world. He is trying to do everything he can to pull us away from righteousness by causing self-centered concepts and by suggesting that there is no God or that there is no need for salvation. Ugh. How many times have I heard that? Oh, there's no God. I have nothing I need to be accountable to or for. There's no need for salvation. There's no life after death anyway. When I'm done, I'm done. Might as well live and party now. Have you heard it? I have. The scripture 150 suggests that we try to gain as much knowledge as we possibly can. 
that we read and study that we may see the truth and wow see the mysteries of the kingdom you want to see them some of it's just in how we interact with each other that's a mystery of the kingdom and if we're living in God's ways wow how special love trust humility is also mentioned and that is defined as a dependence upon God and a respect for others so how are we doing that's in that part of the talk has to do with us becoming better people myself included in the us but there's another aspect of becoming a better people and that is the sharing of becoming a better people I guess we call that missionary attitude at the priesthood retreat I don't know who brought some books I'd like to find out if somebody knows there was a whole bunch of books laying out on a table over in the fellowship hall and somebody just had a little sign there just pick them up you know, if you want to read it pick it up and I picked up one that discussed a new term for me I'd never heard this term before I think the author made it up but it's called lostology lostology the author has created this term to explore how people might feel about going out and finding the lost huh. missionary work how do you feel about going out and finding the lost one of the things he suggests in his opening chapters is the lost don't know they're lost they're having a good time they're happy they don't realize that their future is at stake are we ready to go out and find the lost in his book he cites two examples that I think are really good to think about this is a story about Amanda hearing that a little girl named Amanda has been lost in the woods outside of town you respond to the call for volunteer searchers when you arrive at the base camp for the search you're shocked at what you see Along the edge of the woods, people have parked their motorhomes and travel trailers. Clusters of volunteers sit in lawn chairs around the roaring campfires. And on the grill, we may find steaks are cooking and music is playing and laughter fills the air. Those sitting around the fires occasionally look at maps. A few of the men tell stories of searches they have been out, have been a part of in the past. And occasionally, the search coordinator walks to the edge of the woods and calls out, Amanda! Amanda, come here if you can hear me. Then he walks back to the group by the fire. Outraged, you walk up to him and say, what are you doing? You can't just sit there. That little girl is lost out there. Why aren't you looking for her? The head searcher seems a little bit confused and says, hold on now. We've all made quite a sacrifice to be here already. We had to drive our rigs out here and set up camp, and some folks have drove for three or four hours. Now's the time to eat and to relax. Don't worry, we'll keep our eyes open. Who knows? We may just see that little girl. A good missionary would be fixed on one thing, finding that little girl. And if that's your philosophy, you are a part of the lostology group because you want to find that little girl here's another story from the book on a dangerous sea coast where shipwrecks often occur was a crude little life saving station the building was just a hut and there was only one boat the few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea. With no thought for themselves, they went out day or night, searching tirelessly for the lost. Eventually, so many lives were saved by this wonderful little station that it became quite famous. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding area wanted to become associated with the station and gave it 
their time, money, and effort for the support of its work. Oh, new boats were bought, and the crews were all trained, and the little life-saving station grew. Some of the new members of the life-saving station were unhappy because the new building was crude and so poorly equipped. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge of those saved from the sea. So they replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in the enlarged building. Now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members, and they redecorated it beautifully and furnished it exquisitely because they used it as a club. Fewer members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions, so they hired crews to go out and do the work. The life-saving motif still prevailed in the club decoration, however, and a symbolic life-saving boat dominated the room where initiates joined the club. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and the hired crew bought in boats loads of cold, wet, half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick. Some had the black skin, some of them had yellow skin, and the beautiful club was considerably messed up. So the property committee immediately had a shower house built outside the club where the victims of the shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, a split took place in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the life-saving activities and become unpleasant, which had become unpleasant and a hindrance to their normal life. Some members insisted on life-saving as their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. They finally were voted down. However, and told that if they wanted to save the lives of various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, they could begin their own life savings station down the coast. They did. As the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old. It evolved into a club. And yet another life life saving station was founded, and history continued to repeat itself. And if you visit that coast today, you will see a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in those waters, but most people drown. Are we being a good life, spiritual life saving station? There are indeed two aspects of every good church, as I have mentioned, the spiritual and the temporal building up of the people, which we often think of as sanctification, and the missionary or saving of lost souls. Christ was involved in both. In order for us to become complete, we must become involved in both, or we die as a church. We have been given a lot of insights on how we might achieve the goal and the reality of Zion. I ask you again the question I asked earlier, have we completed the task? In this task, we are all participants doing an assignment for our mission, and we have many assignments in the attempt to keep Christ Church going. Most are really good. We are to work on becoming sanctified. We are to work on preparing the bride. We are to work on preparing a place where Christ can return. We are to work on being a people that are showing the world what living with God is like, and then going forth to help the world become a part of us. Are we putting oil in our lamps? Are we preparing for the bridegroom? the wedding feast? Are we becoming more sanctified? Stoke up the embers. Put more wood on the fire. I don't, and I don't think you don't, want to see this light go out. Do you? It may mean raising the bar of all of our activities more than we have done in the past, myself included. Come, testify of the Christ. Testify that this is his church. Exemplify that to the world. 
rescue the ones who need rescue, minister to the ones who need to be ministered to. Christ is calling us to do that. He is the Savior. He is the Redeemer. And we can point ourselves and others to that. He is also the mediator between us and God. And ask us to bear fruit for the kingdom. For indeed, as the scripture has cautioned us, work for the night is coming. I'm going to leave this scripture as my final scripture reading for the night. It's 158.5c. Be not discouraged, my remnant flock, for my work will never be thwarted. Lay aside those things that cause aught with your brothers and sisters, and live in the light and the joy of the gospel. Determine what must matter most in your individual lives, loving and relying upon God, the Father, for all things good, caring for your families both in and out of the church, and finding security in the redemptive power of the cross and through the atonement of the only begotten Son of God. Saints, it has been mentioned a few times this weekend already that we may be at a crossroads. It may be very close to the time when things are going to get very rough if they haven't already. One of Fred's revelation indicates that the time is already upon us where these things will be happening to us. That we will begin to lose our liberties. We will begin to lose our church. We will begin to lose things if we don't react. So I'm asking you to react. It's not my church. It wasn't Fred's church. It isn't any one of the other leadership's church. It's his. And we all need to react to those things that he wants us to do. And that's going to mean that uh, I, you, all of us, get on our knees and pray. What do you want me to do, Lord? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to react? Where is the lost person in my life that I might be able to approach this day, that I might be able to save them from the doom and destruction that is upon them if they don't change? Each and every one of us has other people in our lives, and if we don't have other people in our lives, maybe we ought to find them. Sometimes I've heard, and I've said it, well, all of my friends belong in the church which is good. That's been true for me now for several years. I come into the office and everybody in the office belongs to the church. The only occasional thing I have that comes at me is perhaps somebody comes into our office and says, I'd like to know more about the Remnant Church. Can you give me a tour? And that happens every now and then. Or we can open up the doors to the visiting center and say hello. Hello. We'd like to share something wonderful with you. Or we can do a better job of live streaming and sharing with the world the mission of the church and the goals of the church. Or you can open up your scriptures and sit on your front porch in your rocking chair and hope that the neighbor walks by and says, What are you up to? Well, I'm reading the Book of Mormon. You're reading what? Tell me about it. Is it good? There's all kinds of things we can do. There's all kinds of ways that we can share. There's all kinds of ways that we can minister to each other. And we need to be doing that desperately. So give it some thought. Give it some prayer. Ask the Lord what he would have you to do. And then respond and go and do. Thank you, Fred. <clears throat> President Patience, for those words of inspiration. May we take those to heart tonight. 
like to apologize for getting tongue-tied earlier, but I was asked to make a couple of announcements uh, earlier that I failed to do, and that is the birth of two new children. One is uh, Amy Elizabeth Romer, parents Andrew and Megan, the grandparents of Lois and Kevin, and also Pierce Bloomquist, grandson of Bruce and Laura Terry. May the Lord uh, bless these parents and grandparents in the upbringing and the spiritual upbringing of these babies into his church. I would ask you that you accept the challenges that have been placed before you tonight by our president, Terry Patience, and continue to move forward in a positive way as we, the Remnant Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, move forward in a positive way. May the Lord grant you that blessing. As been mentioned, uh, tomorrow is a uh, sacrament service. And I would pray that you continue to make preparation for that sacrament service tonight before you go to bed in your prayers and ask the Lord in that prayer, am I worthy of partaking of those emblems? And I pray that he answers you in a very positive way and that you truly examine yourselves as you reach forward for that broken body and spilled blood tomorrow. May we turn our hymnals to number 426. Take my life and let it be. We'll remain standing for the prayer of benediction by priest Keith Kirkshank. Thank you. Our Lord, our God, again we approach thy throne with truly thanks in our hearts for the many blessings that you have given us this day. For your spirit that has been poured out among us, for those testimonies that we have been able to share, we truly do thank you for again restoring thy prophet to this church. May we continue to look to you as our strength, our hope, our guide, that we might put our trust, all of our trust, in thee. 
Help us that we might prepare ourselves to receive that sacrament tomorrow, that we might be prepared to witness the outpouring of thy spirit, that truly we might go forth from this conference, our hearts set on fire, that truly we might be witnesses for thee, that we might be instruments in building thy kingdom. We would ask these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. Just a couple of announcements. The youth will meet in the fireplace room this evening. It is my understanding that President and our First Lady, Cindy Patience, will be in attendance to that. All gentlemen, brothers, with the exception of Brother Richard Parrish and Brother Gary Argus Singer, if you would immediately come up here, we need to set up and go through a practice session for the sacrament service in the morning. If we could please clear this conference center it would be appreciated if you wish to sit and watch. You're certainly welcome to do so. Thank you.